Well, I want to welcome everyone to the Customer Success Webinar Series brought to you by Client Success. We are broadcasting live from the base of the beautiful mountains in Silicon Slopes, Utah and Toronto, Canada. I am Burke Alder, Vice President of Marketing at Client Success. Client Success, I'll tell you a little about us, is a customer success management platform that helps leaders and CSMs manage, retain, and grow their customer base. We do this by providing customer success teams, real-time customer insights, communication, and collaboration at the right time across the customer journey. During today's webinar, we will be hearing from Julie Krasovsky, Partner and Customer Success Advisor of Winning by Design. Julie is a seasoned customer success leader, having pioneered customer success in the early days of marketing automation at Eloqua and running customer success and account management at Influitive. Today we are going to do something really awesome. We are going to be doing a live whiteboard session and which gives you the ability to collaborate. So asking questions, you can use the Q&A. You will also be able to use, um, at some time you can unmute yourself if you do have a specific question when Julie asks, and we'll be collaborating through this whiteboard session. We are recording this webinar, so the insights you see on the whiteboard or in the discussion you hear through the audio will be recorded and be sent to you via email right after, uh, a few hours after this webinar ends. We encourage you to use the Q&A feature. One of the things we love about this is bringing customer success people from all over the world, providing insights, questions, answering those questions, and really creating a unique webinar experience that is very collaborative. It's my pleasure to welcome Julie to the webinar, and I will stop sharing, and you will see her screen, and we'll get going in the whiteboard session. So welcome, Julie, to the Client Success, Customer Success Webinar Series, How to Handle Churn as an Organization and Keep Your Company Focused on Growth. Thank you so much, uh, Burke. I appreciate the intro and welcome everybody. Burke, I'm not sure if this is an option, but if people can turn on their videos, they're welcome to, and then I can see their wonderful faces as well. Um, so this is going to be a little bit of a different webinar, uh, I think, than you're used to, but this is more of the style that we use at Winning by Design when we're doing interactive video, um, because the best way to learn is by uh, collaborating and learning together. So we're going to kick things off, first of all, where I'm going to walk you through a little bit about the SaaS method for sales and customer success, just so we're all on the same sort of playing ground of what we're talking about here. So everyone knows of the funnel, right? And so the typical funnel that you have in sales is you have awareness, education, and then selection, right? Everyone knows this. There's a few stages in uh, a variety of stages there. Uh, but there's a second half of the funnel when you're in SaaS, and a lot of people don't talk about this. The second half of the funnel is where the all-important customer success team comes on board. Um, so here you have same concept, three stages. You have onboarding, usage, or what I like to call the impact stage, and then you have growing. So we're going to spend most of our time today talking about these two last stages of the funnel because this is what's key to your organization's success. In SaaS, while new logos are definitely so important, 75 to 93% of your revenue in your business is gonna come from the growing stage. That's through upsells, cross-sells, renewals, resells, and advocacy to bring in new logos. Okay. I want to pause here for a moment. For, I see the chat, I see there are the chat window uh, flashing a lot and obviously you're maintaining the question and answer. Before I move on past this, does anyone have any questions about, about where we're at right now? I, I think, you know, people can also use the chat function on the sidebar too. I think we're good right now. Okay, just checking. But just so people know, this is the type of interactivity I'm expecting. So this is as much for you to learn uh, as well as for me to share some of the insights that I have. Okay. So, so uh, one, one, one question we had is, um, once again, explaining what is AES, just for uh, maybe some people missed that, and then what is UIG on the no end? Of, yeah, so so here we have the various stages of the funnel. So you have awareness, education, selection, 
on board. I like to use the letters so that way I don't get judged on my spelling. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For impact. And then growing. Nice. All right. No someone, was, someone was mentioning in the middle, maybe is there a handoff between the totally. Uh, well, so <laughs> absolutely. So you got, you know, this is where your your clothes, this is where your handoff is. Um, and, and actually one thing we, we recommend is that the sales process. Oftentimes we say that the sales process ends with the quotes, right? You celebrate the win, you do the transition. Actually, what we want to start seeing from sales teams is that they actually, the sales process actually continues to there. So they're part of the onboard. They're part of that hand handoff. And that's a really critical time. But that's not what today's about. So let's talk a little bit more about that usage, uh, that impact stage and the growing stage. Okay. Cause that's where the huge part of your customer, your, company's value is going to come from. So what's important here? So in this, uh, <clears throat> so as in customer success, you want to focus on getting your customers to use the product. And more important than usage, obviously they need to use it, but you want them to get impact their business, right? If they're just logging into your product every day and going on and using it, they could still leave you, right? The whole point is that they need to be getting impact to their business. Impact could be things like time saving, could be an increase in revenue, it could be a decrease in revenue loss. So those are some uh, generalized impacts that you have on your organization. And there's lots of things you can do in customer success to help the efficiency and help scale that, right? Tools like clientsuccess.com that helps you monitor the usage of your, of your organization, of your customers, so that way you can, you can focus on impact. And what we really want you to do, and the topic of today is to focus on growth. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about what happens when churn gets in the way of this. But really quickly, so I can just finish off um, the closed loops of where you come in and where you can help drive growth. So this customer success, you're in charge of the renewals, but you're also responsible for identifying opportunities for upsell, okay? And this is, this whole funnel gets closed loop when you identify those opportunities. So when you're having a cross sell, it goes back to the, to the beginning of the funnel. So you got cross sell here. Going back to that awareness stage, the start of the funnel, maybe passing back off to sales, depending on your process. You have, um, you have your resell. Right? Someone new comes in, all of a sudden you have to resell your product. That's going to the education uh, you know, part of the funnel. And then um, here you have upsell. So that's uh, a less cumbersome sales process, but it's still a sales process in itself. So here you have a full closed loop from start to finish and back around to really generate that um, recurring revenue cycle in SaaS. Um, Okay, but what happens, as I mentioned, what happens when you have an issue here? When you have an issue around usage and impact? You're not growing. And where does that issue often come from? Comes from um, potentially a trim problem. So we're gonna get into that now. I'm gonna erase this and I'm gonna move on. While I'm erasing this first, let me know if anyone has any other questions that I can answer. Yeah. So how can someone create a feedback loop between their customer success team and developers so that the user feedback contributes to really good UX and UI or even market fit? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's, I love that you're thinking that way. I think that's really important. I think systems, um, again, processes are going to help you get that feedback. So whether you have a feedback tool in place, if you have an advocacy program where feedback is part of that, um, and making sure that it gets in the hands of your, your product team. Depending on the size of your, of your company, I, um, when we were early on at Influitive, I would often bring a developer and a product person in on a call. Um, every single week, I would have a developer on a different customer call, specific around uh, if I knew a lot of feedback would be coming out of that call. It really allowed the you know the development team to get a better sense of what's on the customer's mind and it was a little bit of a sneaky thing that I used to do especially on calls where I knew clients were asking for features that maybe my product team was resistant to build 
often when a developer would be on that call, they'd say, I can build that in 15 minutes and it wouldn't be a problem. But obviously, that only works when you're a certain size. When you get bigger, that tends to be a bit more complicated. Definitely bringing them on calls and then creating a system for feedback. So if you're getting ad hoc feedback, collecting that, shooting that over through some communication, I love it if you have more of a process around that and you have some sort of um, advocacy platform where you're asking for feedback as part of that advocacy, making sure that your product team has access to that and is getting that, or even just a Google Doc, right? Collect it, real time, make sure someone from product is responsible for checking it. Okay, that was a great question, I love it. So here is your, um, anything else, Brooke, before I move on? I think you're good, yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, so here you have, um, you know, this is your amazing bucket of customers, okay? So sales is putting your, your customers in. Here you have all of your, your customers. Around here, they're gonna be onboarding. And that's great. They're gonna continue to, to renew. That's, that's your customer, a very simplified version of your customer life cycle here in the, the bucket. But what happens, obviously, if that's not as seamless, right? If all of a sudden you have a leak in your bucket, right? What happens in that? that that's something that we never want. And all of a sudden your customers are starting to drip out. And it's your responsibility, here's my little teacup, it's your responsibility in customer success to catch those customers and to deal with it. Typically, it's your responsibility. You need to figure out what's going on and you need to get them back into here. But it's not always so simple, right? Sometimes the, the leak in your bucket continues to grow and grow and grow and it's not just a simple fix. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what we're gonna do about it as an organization. Because I think that having this all on the shoulders of customer success, that's not necessarily gonna help the problem because the problem, problem is often fundamentally a larger issue that affects the whole organization. So let's look about what that can be. First things to look at, the, the simplest things to look at when you have leaky customers, the first thing you wanna do is you wanna look at sales. So what is going into your front? What is going into your business? Which customers? Are they selling, is your sales team selling for fit or are they selling for pain? What you want is them selling for pain not fit and here's why often think about this oh we sell to customers that are you know they have 100 employees um or or less and they you know and they're in tech okay well let me tell you a story there's a company that sells elevators and they their, their fit is companies with multi multi-story buildings right makes sense so you look you pull a list of all the companies and you say okay this is our this is the list of companies that we're going to go after all of a sudden someone comes to them and says hey we're a two-story bank we'd really like an elevator well that's not really a fit so we wouldn't necessarily sell them but let's explore okay they bought instantaneously why did they buy well they bought because they had the pain of needing government funding and in order to get government funding, they needed to be fully accessible. And in order to be fully accessible, they needed a wheelchair in order to get to that second floor. Now, that company had two choices. They could then redefine what fit meant and all of a sudden start going after a whole bunch of two-story buildings. But the problem is that they might not all have that pain. And so what they should really be looking for, and so if they sold a bunch of elevators to two-story buildings, what you might see is a bunch of customers leaving because they weren't solving a big enough pain. But all of a sudden, if you shift and your sales team's focused on selling the pain, well, pain is needing to be accessible. That's something that if the company needs that, needs to fix that pain, solve that pain, those are gonna be sticky customers. So that's just an example of the difference between fit and pain. I'm not saying that that's the reason of your churn problem, but what I'm saying is if you do have a churn issue, you do want to look at the profile of the companies that your sales team is selling to to see if they're selling for fit instead of pain. And if that's the case, that's a pretty easy fix. 
you go into the sales, you go into your sales pipeline, you have some discussions with sales and say, look, here are a bunch of customers that have sold on fit and they ended up not lasting with us. Let's talk about how we can get more sales on pay. Um, really one, one, one concept along this that I think is kind of maybe helpful for people if, they're, if you're wanting to go down that route with pain is if you actually maybe take a box and you, you define on the box like those pains, right? What are some of the things that are causing those pains? And then how does your solution actually solve those? Because I think that's a, to bring customer success as a culture in your organization, that, that little simple exercise I just talked about that maybe start with marketing or marketing runs that and sales and customer success and development. Everyone should be on the same page on what, what is it that we're actually solving the problems and that nice um, solution set with our solution so that, you know, it's very consistent across the life cycle of a customer from developers not being in silos to salespeople selling the right pain, like you said. And um, once we've sold to that pain, um, onboarding and customer success, literally driving the solutions to those pains through to upsell, cross-sell success and re renewal. Yeah, absolutely. So take a look at, um, so I wanted to talk about the sales thing first because it can be an easy fix. Yeah. But really, what we want to do is take all the customers. So take all the customers that are in this sort of teacup of churn customers that we need to look at. Okay, we need to figure out why. And so this is very common. We look at the reason why are customers leaving us? Why are they going? <coughs> What's an important understanding? But too many companies spend too much time on that. Um, so we need to understand why they're leaving for sure, but as important, if not more important is why are they staying? So want to look at the segment of customers who are staying, which is a lot more and why are they staying and what you're going to get is impact. You're going to start to understand the impact that your company, your solution has on your customer's business. What happens is, customers are leaving is because you're not giving them enough impact to their business. So it's an important understanding why, and through that understanding of why, you'll get an, a sense of, okay, are people being sold on, on fit? Totally one, one, one simple explanation. So here's sort of your sales, your sales funnel. The next reason could be, um, and this is a relatively easy fix as well. I like to, to go first with what's the most simple thing to adjust, and then we can talk about a more fundamental challenge. The second thing is um, onboarding. Typical time to onboarding, we could throw this out maybe as a, can we do polls, Burke? Um, I think I can, Let's, let me see if I can pull one up. Okay, if you can pull one up, what is the ultimate time to value in onboarding? How many days? Let's throw it up with 30, 60, 90, 120. Um, how many days to first value? I'm not going to give the answer yet. I'll see if, if Burke can throw up a poll. If he can't, don't worry about it. I just threw this in a little last minute. Um, maybe, maybe let's just have them um, maybe chat in the, the, the Zoom webinar chat, what they think. We got 30. Oh, I got to see, see two people throwing it out there. Yeah, 7, 30, 30, 60, 30, 30. It seems like most, most people are 30 or 60. Perfect. Yeah. So totally, 30 is the ideal time to value. You want 30 days. Some, obviously, if your product maybe is premium or something, it needs to be shorter, but 30 days is typical time to value. So yeah, 30 for It looks like if this was a poll, I would say majority is 30, then you have a, a chunk of 60, and then even 90 for a few people. Yeah. I'm not I'd seeing anyone. Okay, you're getting to 90, unless you're at a very, very, very high price point, like really enterprise. Um, that's going to be risky, right? So you want to get to 30 days time to value as best as possible. Again, there's going to be a little bit of a change, but think about it. If, you're, if your contract's only 12 months um, and you really need that renewal, if you're waiting 30, 90 days till first value, you don't have a lot of time. That's just first value. You don't have a lot of time to get to real impact. Um, okay, so that's something you could look at that's also a pretty easy fix. Look at your onboarding process and see, is this – you know, are we, is, is time to value too long? And is that contributing to customers not renewing potentially after the first year because they didn't see value fast enough? And let me just be clear. When I'm saying these are easy fix, they're not easy. They're simple. They're 
they're just less complicated than the next the next thing you need to look at. So, but these are just sort of the let's just rule these out and make sure that these aren't the issues because what you don't want to be doing is is going back to product and saying we need product to make all these changes when really it's it's sort of the funnel the funnel pieces that need to be tweaked. Okay, so you've solved you've ruled out. Sales is doing a perfect job. They're only selling to customers who have the pain that we solve. Onboarding, again, doing a bang up job. They're getting time to value within a reasonable time frame. Okay, what we've realized is that the reason customers stay and the impact that you have on their business is, you know, is, is one thing. And the reason they're leaving is because these customers aren't getting that impact. Well, if it's not because of sales and it's not because of onboarding, then your product isn't delivering what it needs to deliver in order for your customers to get that impact. They were, they have the pain. They have the pain that they need to solve that your product should be solving. They are going through the onboarding process, but in execution, it's just not delivered. So what I want you to look at at this point is at this point, this is when you collect all this feedback and you say product, you need to be responsible for this. And this is where we get a little controversial because what I'm saying here is, when you have a systematic churn problem in your organization, that is fundamentally a, a product-owned issue. And what I want to say- You're saying products, product owns churn, not product customers. Product owns churn. Okay. Yeah. Now yeah. what I want to say is when we look at companies, when churn, you know, if you're having a reasonable churn rate, every, every SaaS organization has some level of churn and some level of predictable churn, and some level of churn that you can identify. Maybe it was a person that impacted, like there's trends that you're gonna be able to solve. But if it's systematic across the organization, your board is gonna start caring about this. And uh, to more than just, hey, what's your churn, is it on track? If you're talking about churn as a systematic issue at the board level, product needs to be driving that conversation because it is a product issue. Customer success can only use so much to solve churn when it's because of product. If product isn't driving the right impact to your customers, they need to figure out what that is. And so, <clears throat> well, one, one question I have for you. So then how does, how does product not just always become the scapegoat? Like, you know, and, and then I think if, if you've been in a customer success role or you've been have, struggling with a churn issue, how do you literally get product to, understand the right use cases to develop the solution that actually drives the impact? Holy, these are some really great questions. I mean, <clears throat> no one can be a scapegoat in this situation because you have to look at, so you have to look at the reason people are staying always, right? You need to understand the profile of your customers in order to understand what went wrong with customers who are leaving. Okay, so we've looked at sales, we've looked at onboarding, we've looked at, you know, you could even look at, um, you know, individual, CS people, right? If there's trends, right? If one person's book of business is leaving at an exponential rate more than other people, well, then those are those are those systems. But if you've ruled out all these other issues, well, it's product. This this gap, this leaky bucket, that's where your product comes in. And so your product's job is to deliver the desired impact to your customers. And if it's not doing that, then you do not have product market fit. You do not have a solution that can scale. And they that's their job. So I'm not looking for product to be a scapegoat, but what I am looking for is product to take ownership of a systematic term problem when it is the product. So that's why you do this sort of forward looking of, of why they're staying and backwards looking of why they've left and rule out a bunch of the reasons and figure out, okay, it's desired impact here. Now, I do think, I'm not trying to get customer, I don't want a whole bunch of product people like banging down my door saying, what did you just do? CS, they can't just hand off and say, well, that's not my issue. CS, you have a role. Your role is to help bridge that gap between their, the, the product challenge and your customers. And what the beautiful thing about customer success, and I always say customers, great customer success teams can buy you two years. If your product, if you've sort of released your product to the market and it doesn't quite have product market fit, 
Your customer success team can do manual things. They can handhold your clients more than you potentially want to do. So process on your CSM team can help bridge that gap. They can buy you a few years. But at some point, and I say it's about two years of a client life cycle, at some point, your clients are going to start leaving no matter how great your customer success team is. The difference is how they do that, right? So I'll tell you a story. Um, you have the customer, you have the customers who, where well, your customer success team isn't fabulous. They just give their turn notice, right? But when your customer success team is doing an amazing job, they actually call their CSM and they say, look, I'm really, really sorry. We've tried all these things and I just can't figure out a way to make it work. That's how you know your CSM team is doing a great job, and it's just that fundamental issue. Um, but you can't scale your organization if you're relying on your customer success team to fix your churn problem. If you want to, because customer success, if you remember this whole funnel thing, um, you know, you got your funnel over here. You need your customer success team to be focusing on growing. That's how you get that huge revenues for your organization. Want to pause there for a minute. How are we doing, Burke? So um, we're doing good. I think one person, maybe just taking a step back, when you, what do you, when you consider time to value, what are some characteristics of the time to value you're describing? Is it ROI? Is it um, like you could actually explain, hey, for every dollar you spend in our system, it looks like I've helped you get $2 savings um, or, or is it more hey, beneficial things like putting all your data in one place? But that's one question I saw. Okay, let's think about it this way because every company is different, right? So if I knew the business, we could dig into it a little bit more. But what I would say is this. You want your power user, your champion, after 30, 45 days to be able to go to their executive team and say, here's, here's why we bought this product. Here's a win. A customer success team, you want to be able to go and send an email or uh, um, you know, uh, some sort of chart to show, here's something you got for buying this product, and here are some initial results. I think saying here's the full ROI of your product after 30 days is a little aggressive. First value. First value is just one tangible thing that you're that your champion or you can go to the executive team of your clients and say, here's a win. Right, here's something of value. You can't, it starts with value, and then after over the cycle of the year, you start to get to real impact. You start to get to, that's when you start to get to the real savings of, or you know, revenue opportunities. Yeah, I think that's a great first point as people think about that 30, 60, 90, how do I drive that first value where they can go back and say, hey, we solved that first challenge of why we bought this, and. Now we're moving forward. So thank you for asking that. Um, there's been tons of questions along the side, but I'll let you keep on going because I know people want to. It's a good opportunity to pause for questions. I kind of raced through this model a little bit and we can definitely get into a little bit more, but I want to hear some questions. I want to know what people have on their minds. So this is uh, one from, you know, this is a scenario that uh, Daniel talks about. He says, our product will absolutely solve the pain if it's properly used. To have impact, the customer must use the product to create a business-specific model. We deliver in-product aids for models, building, and um, let me see what gets. The issue is customers are impatient. Some will skip over in-product aids and don't read the help. Um, so how do I motivate customers to spend time to learn and build in an effective model of learning? So, look, um, <clears throat> You use a product like email, everyone needs email, right? Or like, you can think about any product. If it's not simple to use, you can't force people to change their behaviors. You can encourage them, but the great, you know, the reason we have and the explosion of designers and UX and UI rules in these organizations is to make the onboarding, and especially if your product is so simple that people are supposed to be onboarding themselves, it has to be just that. It needs to be clear enough that people can use it themselves. People are totally impatient. But if you look at the popular games that you know that took off, um, especially when when like 
as Zynga was first coming out and you started like, the, the first games that came to fruition that became really, really popular, they were simple to use and they didn't force people to click next, 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 next. They were embedded in the actions of your product. And so, again, this is a product issue. If people are fast forwarding these walk, you know, these walkthroughs, well, it's because they're not embedded in their natural behaviors and people don't want to spend time doing that. So again, look at, you know, throw that back to product, get them looking at how people are onboarding and change that onboarding process into intuitively in the product. So that way people don't, don't skip over the imperative parts to getting them successful. Nice. And um, thank you for answering that. Another question, do you feel like time to value should be segmented by account type? Some people have across their, their selling into mid-market at enterprise. Would there be different definitions in those teams? Um, could there be? It sounds. There could be. Look, time to value. Um, and I think, you know, I don't want to spend too much time on this because it's yeah. pretty, um, you know, you have to look at a few things. If it's, a, if it's an annual renewal, then time to value is critical. You literally have a ticking clock of 12 months before the customer is ready. And it's not even 12 months. You have a ticking clock of nine months, really, since from first sign for the customer to get enough value to make that decision to renew. Because what you don't want is your CS team scrambling at the last minute to create value. I used to do something with my account management team. We, at some point at Implode, we split customer success and account management. We get that for a certain time period. Every, I find every company goes through this because it's at Eloqua too, and I see tons of clients doing this. You're all together, then you split, then you come back together, then you change a bunch of roles. Totally natural as your company starts to scale. So at this point, we had split up our CSM and our account management team. And one thing that we did as account managers is I had them call into every account at the six month mark. And the conversation was very simple. Are you planning on renewing? And if yes, great. What would make, follow up with a question, what would make you know, this a slam dunk for you? What would, what would it mean at the end of the year for this to be one of the best things you've ever purchased? And what would make it for, what would, what would have to happen in order for you to want to introduce this to other areas of your organization? So if they're getting value and they plan to renew at six months, this is your opportunity to stop the top of Oprah. But also just as valuable for your organization is when they say no. Because if they say no at six months, you have six months to win back their business as opposed to finding out at renewal. So if you do have that churn issue, this is a really good way to combat that. And I love it as a proactive way to, to start laying foundation for um, upsell and cross-sell. But again, I really want to get into the, the, the foundation, really the meat of today's topic, which is the churn issue, because it's a pretty radical, you know, I've been on, I've been in board meetings and CS teams are the ones, you know, the CS leader is the one who's coming up and talking about what we're doing about churn. And if you look at that, and it's like, okay, we've created this new process, we're looking at this, that's not addressing the fundamental issue at hand. And the fundamental issue of why people are churning, if you have a churn issue in your organization, is because their customers are not getting enough impact. And when that happens, product needs to look at what about the product isn't delivering on its promise. And the more important reason of why I want this shift to happen, why this shift is so important to happen, not just I want it, but it's so important for this to happen, is because we just, at the beginning of this webinar, we talked about the impact that CS teams have on the business. And you own, and you're responsible for 75, all the way up to 90, 92, 93% of revenue for your organization. And if you're spending your time looking backwards and saving customers, time and time and time again, you aren't growing the business in the most efficient way, that closed loop cycle. You're not spending your time on that. And that's how SaaS companies today are going to win. There are so many products out there, right? I think we saw um, like the latest, even just in marketing technology, right? I think there's like 4,000 or 5,000 MarTech tools out there, right? There's only so many companies to sell to and so much budget to sell against. Your biggest competitions out there most of the time is just competing for budget. And so that's why when you're already in there, you're already in as a vendor, and I'll tell you, procurement teams, 
the, the ever so popular and growing role of CROs, you know what they're spending their time on? They are looking at the tech staff. They are looking at the 29 to 80 SaaS products that your organization is using and they're looking to consolidate that. And how many of your potential customers are saying, you know what, I can't even look at you, you, know, you should talk to your sales team. How often do they hear, we might get tons of value from your product, but we can't buy anything right now until we figure out what we can get rid of. So your competition is often just other random SaaS products. So if you're in at an organization, not only should you be figuring out how to stay, you should be figuring out how to grow. And that is the companies who really focus and train their CS teams and create processes for their CS teams to do that growth and to identify that growth and to create that closed loop, whether it's passing back to sales or an account management team or doing it on their own, that is how you are going to be successful today. I, I think that's such a, I think that's an in, such an interesting concept because I would say most of customer success is focused on the the red reports and the red and the red and the you know these are the reasons and and I love how you've, you've articulated two things what is the impact and how does that impact help an account grow just imagine a full list of things that we were actually bringing into meetings that say hey here's how we drive impact here's how we drive growth of our clients versus here how we save everybody. Yeah. I think it's a, uh, it's that, how, what percentage of people do you think are out there are, are just focusing on this, why they're leaving and, and how many people that when you meet with them, what percentage do you think? Oh, that's a tough, I, I don't have a percentage for you. I would say too many are focused on sort of that red report. And I would say, you know, um, at the risk of, of who's sponsoring this webinar, this is a challenge with tools like client success, what you offer. And I think, when your customers use these tools, they need to use it in a very specific way. I don't want your customers to use it as a crutch and say, okay, we have this tool in place, we're, we're good. What these tools are used for is to help your organization scale on the things that your team shouldn't even be thinking about. Your customer success team should not have to go anywhere to look at how many people are using the product or these like the uses and metrics that are easily trackable. That is something that your CS team should say, okay, that is, that is being covered. I don't need to worry about that. And then they can look towards um, growth. But what I do see is a lot of CS leaders say, you know what, we've implemented a tool and now we're good, right? The tool is a way for you to say, okay, I'm done with this and now I'm going to figure out to tackle the growth challenge because no one's tackling that today. Topper doesn't address this right now. Um, <clears throat> for a pause for a minute, anything else uh, that you, that that's pressing that people want to hear about? Um, no, I think. Okay. Uh, yeah, <laughs> the people yeah. are they're they're doing good. I think there's they're collaborating with themselves, listening to okay, you cool. as you bring these um, questions. I'll. I think. Yeah, that, question, just put it in the. The chat and I'll, I'll make sure I get it to Julie. Thanks. Okay. Um, one thing that um, I think is important, let's think about an analogy. And a lot of winning by design's methodologies are science backed, right? We look at a lot of the cognitive function of how people work, how buyers buy. But I also want you to think about your CS organization. And um, I'm going to use a tennis analogy because I, I love tennis and it's just it's what I'm coming up with right now. So in tennis, do you ever notice that? Um, you know, you have an amazing, you know, um, an amazing tennis player, and sometimes they just can't get their serve in. They just can't do it. And I'll tell you, in practice, they've done amazing. They can, you know, the next game, the next day, they'll be acing, and acing is when you serve, and the person can't even return because it's such an amazing serve. Often, that in sports, and I like tennis because it's a single player game too, in sports, when you start to fail, you get into this psychological loop of failure. And when CS teams are focused on the reasons companies, customers are leaving you, they also get into that psychological loop of failure. And your team is going to get worn down fast. And you need to be able to focus on the wins to keep the energy up, to keep the retention of your team up. And also, that's what's fun, right? You don't become an athlete 
because you're losing every game and like that's not what's going to motivate you you become an athlete because you've experienced what it's like to to win a little bit and that keeps you going and that keeps you going through the tough times so you need to be focusing on that wins i think looking forward and looking at the group of customers and why they stay is more important than just looking at the reason why they're leaving because this is this is who you want your team your product team to be building for too right you want to make sure that you're focusing on you know sometimes customers buy you for an impact that your product doesn't even solve for and if you miss that half of the equation and you're just saying oh well these customers left because they wanted this impact maybe that's not even important maybe that's not even what you do so you don't want to lead them in the wrong direction and another, um, I want to share one more sports analogy, it's so relevant to customer success. And it's just, um, in, uh, I played a lot of baseball growing up. And one of the practices you do in baseball is you, um, and really any sport you play is this concept of swinging through or running past first base. And why do you do this? Why do you run past the base at first? Why do you not stop on contact? It's because the ball won't go anywhere where you need it to go. And so I really, like, the customer success teams, they stop on contact. What's contact for a customer success team? Contact renewal. Contact is usage. You are not going to take your company where you need it to go. You need to swing through. You have to follow through or run past that baseline in order to get to growth. I've seen this time and time again. The companies that have a focus on growth, I've, I've been in this role myself where my team has outsold the sales team. Q3 coming up on a year, sales missed their number, account management made up for it in cross-sell and upsell. And you know what? That's even more valuable sometimes than getting new logos because it's showing that, okay, while you haven't been able to, for whatever reason, bring new logos in the door, the customers you have get such immense value and drive such impact to the organization, they're willing to double down, triple down, quadruple down on their investment in your organization. That signals, that signals huge value to investors and to growth potential. Nice, yeah, I think that's a, that's a huge point. So how much of impact when you think about this is helping people change their behaviors? Well, you mean customer success teams or clients? What, 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 excuse me? When you say people change their behaviors, are you talking about? The clients that? using a tool, like let's say the impact requires, it, it is something new and the or, or, organization has previously been doing it this way and to get the new results, they're gonna use the solution they've purchased, plus they need to change a little bit of their behavior to achieve the impact. Is there anything that helps them achieve yeah, I think so. What so you have to think about like many reward loops, right? Because we're really, really busy, and we're not going to spend the things uh, in our time in our day if you're not getting those reward loops. And so, if you look at, um, I'm going to shift over this way so that way I don't walk myself off the screen here. <laughs> um, if you, you know, if someone, if you're asking someone to change their behavior. Um, so you're asking them to do something different than they normally do. There needs to be something that comes back that makes that hit, you know, makes their brain feel good about it, right? So they're encouraged to do it again. But if it's gonna be too long of a path to get there, guess what? They just got an email. They're they're done. Right? They just got a customer call, they just got a Slack notification. They're out, they're done. So attention spans are down. So if you need to change behavior, it has to be fun. It has to be real. It has to have this sort of reward loops in it, but it also has to be so critical to their business, right? And so I look at creating processes. And yeah, I think especially in early days of your organization, um, a lot of this can be handled with a little bit of muscle, right? People power is huge for figuring out process. And so you know, back to an earlier question around. Um, what processes and what are you going to do in order to get this back to product? There's information about product feedback. There's the one things of analysis that you've done, hopefully with product, to say what impact are customers having that make them stay. What are the what are you want blocks? What are the the categories of reasons why our customers are leaving? 
And then also, before you go back and you know do a major fix in your organization, is there something that your CS team can do in the process that can test it out, right? Is there something that your CS team can do, you know, let's say with a grouping of customers to figure out what the right answer is? Totally. But again, I'm not saying pass this to, to product and say, all right, CS no longer cares about churn. You care. When you're going to that board meeting and if you're responsible for presenting on something, let product present on what they're doing about churn. Okay, we're working with CS to do this, this, and this. We're building out this, this, and this. And we're doing some analysis on, on these groups of customers. That's a good answer for product to have. And then CS leaders, when you walk into the board meeting, you're going to talk about, here's what we're doing to grow our existing customers. Here's our projections for how much revenue we're going to bring into our organization. I'm really frustrated in seeing um, CS leaders not have enough tie into revenue in organizations and they really own and are responsible for so much of that revenue and you're passing off you're passing off that power to other people in your organization for no reason they don't have that line of sight like you do they don't have the relationships with you yeah yeah that, that, that's a i think i mean that's the power of owning the number post sales the, the drives growth numbers, you know, to be able to, to, to land in an account and expand through more usage or consumption or however your, your model, your, your product is, is built uh, is, I think, key to the focus on that growth and, and then kind of helping product focus on why, why they're not getting to impact. How do people start there? How do you, what would you suggest is a good way to get started? I mean, I would imagine most on the webinar have a, a list of things that are the reasons they're churning. What would you suggest someone would do to get first understanding of impact of why they stay? And then next, what would be your top three things you would have someone do to focus on growth? Uh, okay. So to answer your first question, um, uh, I'll break it down to two, two, two things. Um, you should know the impact your customers are getting um, because that is what you should be talking about in all of your meetings with your customers. So when you're doing your impact review, your check-ins, when you're doing your um, executive business reviews or your six-month check-ins, whatever you call them, QBRs, whatever you do, impact is critical. And there's a framework that we have a learning by design, a way to ask certain questions to uncover impact, but you should be talking about impact. Your CS team should be Having a conversation about impact, say, if not every, then 90% of your calls with your customers. So knowing what impact your customers are getting should be, any CSM should know, this customer is getting this, this customer is getting that. They should know this. Is it happening? I'm not so sure. Well, actually, I am sure it's not happening, but that is what we need customer success teams to do in order to get to that next level. So um, categorize that, right? If you're not capturing the impact that your product has, sit down in a room and say, let's run through the customer list and let's find out this customer, what's the impact? And run through it and get those trends. And then do the same thing. The looking at why your customers are leaving tends to be a little bit hard because not only do you want to know why customers are leaving, but you do want to then segment them. You want to find, you have to find trends. Otherwise, the data is useless. And that's manual. You can use a little bit of information. I do like the idea of using um, if you have like, a tool, like your tool, um, in place, you can use that to categorize. Okay, show me all customers that had a, you know, whatever you're categorizing is usage, whether it's mm. login or whether it's, you yeah. know, whatever those fields are, find me all the ones who have a less than a certain percentage. And then look at those customers and find trends within those customers' bases, right? Did they onboard at a certain time? Did they have a certain person? Is there, are they in a certain field? Why do they buy? Look at those factors um, to really find those trends and capture those. Um, and one of the top three things to focus on growth, I think that was your next question, Bert. Yeah. So now, now they have a nice, everyone has this nice list of why people stay with their customer. The product is now working on churn as a team. We're providing some insights from customer success into that. The product owns that in the board perspective. Customer success, like you said, owns this impact. And But, but what should I do uh, to grow this? I mean, what if, what if my product doesn't have 
upsell potential or cross sell? Like, what are your thoughts on some things I can do to grow accounts or, or to grow? Okay, so we've already identified that cus customers grow from impact. I'm gonna erase this. Are we okay if we move on? No, yeah, that's good. It's gonna happen. Um, so we already know that customers grow from impact, or you can't grow from impact. I do want to address one quick thing on impact. There's two forms of impact. There's emotional impact and there's rational impact. We did it, I was just doing a training this morning with a, with a client, and you know we talked about a simple analogy of a 10-year-old car. You have a 10-year-old car, it's rusty, it's old, whatever the reason is, you're in the market for a new car, right? So we looked at all the potential reasons why uh, the impact that this car has on you and why you'd be buying a new car. Okay, well, one reason could be it's old and it costs a lot of money and you're about, it's broken down and you're about to have to sink a ton of money into it. Well, that's huge impact to you, rationally, because it's going to cost a lot of money and so you need to buy a new car. Another reason could be, okay, you have just grown your family and you've grown out of your car and you need to go on a road trip and your current car doesn't have enough seats to fit everyone in your family. Hugh, that's huge impact. That's a very rational impact. You need to buy a new car. Okay. Another reason could be I get in my car and it's freezing outside and um, I really want the hand warmers. Um, the, the steering wheels for people who live in warm climates, you have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> 15 degrees Celsius today, which I don't even know what that is in Fahrenheit. It's flipping cold. And so when you get in your car that's been sitting in your driveway, the steering wheel heater is like the best thing in the entire world. Um, that's not so rational. I mean, it's a little bit rational, but you're not going to buy a car because it has a steering wheel heater or not. You're not going to buy a new car, certainly. It's emotional. I want to sit in the car and I want my hands to be warm. I could wear gloves. Totally, but I want my hands to be warm. That's an emotional impact. It makes me feel good driving when my hands are nice and toasty. Um, you know, I want just to look cooler. I don't love the fact that I drive a minivan. It doesn't really mean my persona. Maybe, you know, other people might think that, but I see myself in like, you know, a cool four by four with the roof over the head. So, you know, <laughs> that's an emotional impact if I ever heard of one that find me a car that fits all my kids and my dog and all their stuff. Um, and lets me drive a car that fits my persona. So I'm giving you those examples of emotional impact and rational impact because in order to focus on growth, you need to both understand, understand both of those elements for your customers. Why are they buying from a business impact perspective? Why are they buying and why are they staying with you and why are they growing from an emotional impact? Those things can be things like um, uh, <clears throat> because their job is on the line or they want a promotion. And using your product helps them show off how great a job they're doing, and so they want to be able to get that promotion. Um, you help them save time in their day so that way they can get home for dinner with their family. Um, these things are emotional, and these are the reasons your customers stay, and these are the reasons why your customers are going to grow. Now, for, you talked about what if your product has no upsell potential? Whew. Okay, well, I actually will say, there's always upsell potential. Um, and maybe it's not, you're not there yet, but as an organization, if you, and as a SaaS organization in particular, if you're not thinking about new products that you can add on, then you, know, you should start thinking about that. And CS plays a huge role in that, right? So um, if you look at what, when you're talking to products, um, this is actually a, a real story um, where I was uh, running CS and Product was releasing, you know, this this new. They had it in beta, and they were about to release it to all of our customers. And I looked at the product. I said, "This drives so much impact to customers around this particular use case. If we roll it into our existing platform, and customers are getting it for free, a they're not maybe are they're not going to use it, and they're not going to actually see it as having such value and impact to their business as it could. But also, we're missing a huge opportunity here." And product came back and said, well, as is, we can't really justify selling it. I said, yeah, but when we talked to a bunch of customers who are using it. We said, what would make you pay for this? And we talked about some additional features and functionality that they could build in pretty simply into that one product, like that one add-on, that would actually make it not just a roll-up product, but an add-on. 
And it was so quick to implement that they were able to run it into the next release cycle. And within a month, we got it out, rolled out, including a product marketing campaign, and were able to sell it to customers for the last quarter of the year. Nice. It was huge. And so that, those types of things are how your CS team should be thinking about how to drive more revenue for your organization. Cool. And then I, think we've got, I think we've got probably two minutes, so you'll have to do your flash round of, of why, you know, their next steps of why they grow. Um, and then we'll, uh, we'll thank you for being on. Yeah. So flash that, I mean, look, I can't cover it all. I think it's a, it's a yeah. fun thing. You have to create processes of how to grow. I think yeah. um, the biggest issue I'll say today, when I stand in front of CS teams, they have not been trained on how to sell. And they don't want to sell because they feel like sales is like a dirty word, right? You go to CS people and say, what would I tell you that sales is part of your job? Half of them are going to say, no way. But I'll tell you, that's because they don't understand what sales is all about. And what sales is all about is exactly what customer success does. Uncovering impact and helping your customers grow. Customers expect to spend more money with you, especially in SaaS. They get it and they're happy to do it when they are get, giving them the right impact. And so let's train CS teams on how to speak with customers to do that in a way that is, you know, cs -y. that makes customers feel good and CS teams feel good. Yeah, I, I think that's, a, you know, selling on value, right, um, versus selling on features and... Impact, for impact. I don't like value. Value can be a whole bunch of things. Impact is real, impact. real for the organization. Emotional and rational impact. Well, I appreciate the time you've spent today. Julie, it's been phenomenal. Uh, the questions have been coming. You've answered a lot. There's probably six more of these sessions we could do together. To a lot of the questions in there, like who should really own the renewal? How do we get uh, CS to sell? But I appreciate what you've talked about today from you know, help, helping sales. If you're having a churn issue, focus on the pain. Maybe focusing on onboarding too if you feel like you've got a churn issue. And then making sure it's very clear for your organization what the, like you said, the rational and the emotional impact is, and then have this, you know, focus on growth. It's been phenomenal. Uh, we're lucky to have you as part of the customer success community. Um, I love this community that's growing. It's kind of like the early days of marketing automation in some way. Yeah, it's exciting. You know, I was part of that. It was really exciting when I was at Eloqua. It was starting to remember our first community we ever rolled out. It was super exciting, and it is definitely exciting. It's great to be part of it. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for everyone who attended and for your great questions. Keep them coming. Um, and thanks. Uh, if you want to reach out, I'm happy to help. Yeah. So Julie's on LinkedIn. You can find her there. You can look at Winning by Design. And um, we're appreciative of your time today for your expertise. So thanks for everyone who joined from all over the world. The customer success community is together, marching together to drive impact and growth. And I appreciate that. So that's the message we'll leave today. Thanks for joining us from Silicon Slopes and Toronto, Canada, where I guess it's minus 14. Someone converted that. So stay warm, Julie. And we'll see you later. See you, customer success people. Bye, Take care. Okay, bye.